you have a Bible or a Bible app, you can flip to Philippians chapter 3. And let me go ahead and pray, and, and we'll get started this morning. Father, we thank you so much for this beautiful weather this weekend. We ask that you help us all to be able to get out and get some yard work done. Uh, and uh, we just ask that you keep everyone safe this weekend and next weekend as folks are traveling a lot. And Lord, we just ask that you be with us this morning um, in our hearts, and we just ask that you would speak to us through your word in the book of Philippians. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. So we live in America, obviously, and in America we are a country that's kind of all about results and success and achievements, aren't we? That's, that's really, uh, really at the core of kind of the American system is, is uh, you know, go out and, and achieve your goals and go out and succeed and get those results. And our, our entire economy, our, and really our entire social structure is really driven by that idea. It's all about succeeding and, and achieving. And it, this is all over the place. It's in our education system, right? In our education system, uh, you know, we're not so much concerned about how you're developing as a, as a human being. We're not so much concerned about if you're an emotionally stable person or in a healthy place in your heart. We're mostly just concerned with, you know, getting those results, getting those good grades so that you can go to college, get a scholarship, get more good grades so that you can get a good job, right? And that's kind of what it's about, isn't it? And it's in the business world too, isn't it? It's kind of a, they call it a dog-eat-dog world, right? And in the, business, uh, in the business world in America, it's all about, again, results. You go get that job, you gotta, you got to have results. And it doesn't matter if you're a nice person. If you don't get the results that we want, that we're looking for, we're going to have to let you go, right? And, and that's how most jobs are. We're not willing to be patient with people. We're not willing to let them grow into their role. It's kind of like, hey, you know, you've got this time, and, and, and if we don't see what we want to see, then, then we're going to have to have a conversation with you. And unfortunately, that mindset has even creeped into the church. I have, unfortunately, uh, many friends that I've gone to college with that uh, were let go uh, from a ministry in the church within the first six months or the first year because they weren't, they weren't seeing the numbers that they wanted to see, and they weren't seeing the results that they wanted to see, you know, not enough kids in the youth group. And we're not willing to, to be patient with people and, and, and value maybe what's going on in here rather than, again, the results. And in our society, you know, people who achieve great things are really put up on a pedestal, aren't they? People who achieve great things do something new. People who maybe start their own business and, and turn it into this billion-dollar industry, those are the people we put up on a pedestal. Uh, great athletes, great musicians, great artists, we kind of we put them up here and we say, look how great they are, because they've achieved something, right? Someone, uh, think of someone like, uh, you know, maybe like a Steve Jobs or, or someone like that. A lot of times it's, it's a person who maybe morally and ethically, we, we wouldn't really support necessarily the things that they do in their personal life. But who cares, right? You, thanks for our, my iPhone, right? You brought us so many great things. And so we, we put you up on this pedestal. And we do that, with again, with athletes and musicians. You know, I don't, I don't care if you, if you beat your wife last week. I just want you to throw that ball really far. <laughs> I, I mean, seriously, that, that's what we do, isn't it? We are all about results and success to a fault sometimes. It, it's actually uh, kind of disturbing when you really stop and think about it. Um, there's many examples of that, right? Uh, someone, like, someone like Tiger Woods who, uh, you know, did some, some, some really unfortunate things, made some really poor life choices, and, and then ultimately it's just kind of a thing where we're like, well, you know, we just, we just really want you to win more golf tournaments. <laughs> and uh, we're willing to kind of look past those kinds of things. And that just happens far too often. We turn these people into icons, not because of who, who they are, but because of what they can, they can do and what they can achieve. And so that's why it's particularly difficult for us as Americans, I think, to see what Paul talks about in Philippians chapter 3 and to really let it sink in as reality in our hearts and, and um, to take hold of this idea. And this chapter, chapter 3 of Philippians Paul talks about how we should put no confidence in the flesh. 
We should put no confidence in the flesh. He says, when it comes to our salvation, when it comes to the way that we are saved, we need to stop thinking in terms of what we have done or what we have achieved because none of that is actually going to matter in the long run, is what Paul says. And again, this is really, really hard for us to, to, uh, to admit and to let become a reality in our lives and in our faith. It's very difficult for us. We all have a, descent, a tendency to want to put confidence in ourselves, don't we? We want to feel like we have some sort of control over the situation, don't we? When it comes to our, our standing with God, whether we think we're in good standing or not, we like to feel like I'm in control. I can... I can do better, right? I can kind of earn it. I can, I can do good things, and, and God will, will look down on me because of that, and, and, and I'll be saved because of that. And we have a tendency to put confidence in ourselves and to think that at least in some way we are doing something that's earning our way into heaven. We all do that from time to time. And again, that's our, that's be, part of that is because of our lifestyle. Part of our lifestyle in this society is it's just all about Earning whatever you want. If you want it, you go, you go earn it, right? You go get it. Work hard for it. That's just kind of ingrained in our DNA as Americans. But Paul says we have to learn to stop putting confidence in ourselves, and instead we must put confidence in Christ, is what Paul says. He says faith in ourselves equals loss, but faith in Christ equals gain. And this is a major theme in the book of Philippians, this idea of loss versus gain, okay? If you remember, in chapter 1, we have the famous verse for, Paul says, For to me, to live is Christ, and to die is gain. And so here in chapter 1, Paul's talking about whether he would rather live or die, is what he's talking about. He says, I've been beaten and imprisoned so many times, you know, I'm, I'm a little tired of it, I'm a little worn out. If I'm being honest, it would be better for me to just die. I would be able to stop suffering, and I could just go be with Jesus. (laughs) So Paul says, for me, to die would be gain. As is with all Christians, we all gain when we die, because we get to go be with the Lord. But then he also talks about how, you know what, though, if I live, I can keep preaching the gospel. And so for the sake of the church, it would be better for me to stay alive. And so he says, for me to live is Christ, because Christ can be preached if I go on living. And so in chapter one, Paul talks about this idea of loss versus gain when it comes to his own life. But here in chapter three, Paul talks about loss versus gain in sort of a different way. He talks about it in terms of what we put our faith in. When it comes to how we find our security or where we find our comfort, where we find our identity, and ultimately where we find our salvation. Are we putting our faith and our confidence in ourselves? Or are we putting our faith and our confidence in Christ? That's basically the all boiled down. That's the question that Paul is addressing here. And Paul doesn't beat around the bush. He makes it abundantly clear. Again, he says, confidence, faith in ourselves equals loss. Faith in Christ equals equals gain. So let's break this down a little bit. For starters, we have to understand why Paul is talking about this, okay? So to understand why Paul is talking about this, we have to read verse verses 2 and 3. So let's go back and read verses 2 and 3 again. It says, Paul says, watch out for those dogs, those evildoers, those mutilators of the flesh. This is pretty, pretty strong language Paul's using here. Watch out for those dogs, evildoers, and mutilators of the flesh, For it is we who are the circumcision, we who serve God by His Spirit, who boast in Christ Jesus and who put no confidence in the flesh. And so Paul here, he's warning the Philippian church to watch out for these, he says, evil people, and he calls them mutilators of the flesh, which sounds like a, you know, kind of a weird thing to call someone. We don't exactly use that phrase, right? So what exactly is Paul talking about? Well, though he doesn't specifically say it, he knows that the church that he's writing to understands who he's talking about. So he doesn't have the need to specifically say it. But we know that Paul was talking about Jewish Christians. So people who were Israelites, who were Jews, who have now put their faith in Jesus. He's talking about Jewish Christians who still taught, however, that you had to be circumcised to be saved. 
And so there were some Jewish Christians still running around saying, hey, you know, Jesus is great. All the things he did were great, but you still have to be circumcised. Otherwise, you're not saved. And so uh, for those of you who may not understand why they would be teaching this, to make a very long story short, all 39 books of our Old Testament, to make it very short, uh, in the Old Testament, God ordered all Israelites, he ordered them to circumcise their male children on the eighth day. And so as an Israelite, being circumcised and being part of the community of, of circumcised males was the sign that you were God's people, and it was a core part of their identity. I know I am one of God's people because I have been circumcised. And so it was impossible to separate being an Israelite from being circumcised. It was deeply ingrained in, in their identity as God's people. And this is just actually one of many examples of how the Jews and the Israelites, they found their security and their salvation in things of the flesh. It wasn't just circumcision. It was other things as well. If you remember, God required them to make animal sacrifices to atone for their sins. And so in their mind, um, that was a, a physical act, a, a, a physical deed that you would do that would quite literally earn your salvation and your forgiveness from God, right? And so the circumcision, animal sacrifice, also just um, obtaining to the law and, and the laws that they had in the Old Testament, the scriptures, following that law to a T. You had to do that. You had to follow the law. You had to follow all the rules. And that also is a way that they viewed that they were earning their good standing with God. And so there were many ways that as a Jew, you were under the mindset that you did put confidence in the flesh because, hey, I have been circumcised. I am making the sacrifices I need to make. I am following the law. And so as a Jew, it was very easy to put confidence in the flesh, in earthly things, and in things that I can, I can actually do myself, right? But when Jesus comes around, he changes things a little bit. And he says, basically, he says, hey, you don't have to worry about putting your confidence in all these things that you can do anymore. I'm just, just going to do it for you. <laughs> he says, all you have to do now is just look to me. You don't have to worry about all these other things. He says, all you have to do is put your faith in me. And when this happens, of course, many Jews, they just couldn't accept it. They couldn't accept it. Their way of understanding God is through these things of the flesh, right? And these, these uh, earthly things. And uh, so they just couldn't wrap their minds around another way that they could relate to God or, or obtain good standing with God. And so even many Jews who did put their faith in Christ... Even many Jews who did become Christians, again, they still kept preaching that, well, yeah, we're Christians, but you still have to be circumcised. And Paul says, no, that's, that's not true. And so Paul here, he calls these people uh, who still preach the necessity of circumcision, he calls them mutilators of the flesh because they still require that you have to be circumcised. And so Paul, he fights against these beliefs. Uh, this this idea of putting confidence in, in circumcision and the law, and uh, he fights against it pretty pretty strongly here. Pretty strong word words, pretty strong language that he's using. Paul is he's not happy with these people. He says, "You guys, you've got it all wrong." Okay, he even calls them evil doers. And so that all leads into these verses that we really want to focus on today, which is verses three through nine. When again, basically, Paul says in a nutshell, again, faith in ourselves is, is a loss. However, faith in Christ is a gain. So let's, let's go ahead and read verses 3 through 9 again. Paul says, For it is we who are the circumcision, we who serve God by His Spirit, we who boast in Christ Jesus. And so he's saying, instead of boasting in the things that we do, instead we boast in what Christ has done. He says, and who put no confidence in the flesh, though I myself have reasons for such confidence. If someone else thinks they have reasons to put confidence in the flesh, I have more. So, so Paul's, he's just laying it all out there here. He's kind of bragging on himself a little bit. He says, if anyone thinks they have confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews. He said, if there ever was a Hebrew... A true Hebrew, it's me. <laughs> he says, in regards to the law, a Pharisee. As for zeal, persecuting the church. As for righteousness based on the law, faultless. 
He says in verse 7, But whatever were gains to me, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. What is more, I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. So he says, everything that you thought you knew as an Israelite about uh, who you were in God, it is all a loss now in comparison to what Christ has done for you. He says, uh, end of verse 8, I consider them garbage. Most of your uh, older English translations probably say rubbish. The NIV says garbage. I consider them garbage that I may gain Christ. And be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness that comes from God on the basis of faith. So firstly, Paul says, again, that to put faith in ourselves and confidence in the flesh is lost. He says in verse 3, it is we who boast in Christ Jesus instead of boasting and putting confidence in the flesh. And he uses himself as, he, as an example. He says, listen, guys, if anybody, if anybody would have been capable of having confidence in the flesh, of having confidence that the things I have done have earned me a good spot in heaven, if, if anyone could say that I have lived my life in such a way that I know I'm in good standing with the Lord, if anyone could say that, it would be me, Paul says. I am a Hebrew of Hebrews. I have done everything you are supposed to do as an Israelite. He says, I have been so passionate for my faith, I've even persecuted Christians. He says, as for following the law, faultless. He says, you think you're good at following the law? You got nothing on me. I followed the law to a T. Paul was very passionate about his faith. And he says, if anyone could have boasted in themselves, it was me. But then he says in verse 7, But whatever were gains to me, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. What is more, I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. And then again, I consider them garbage that I may gain Christ. That's a strong word, garbage. Again, most Old English translations use the word rubbish. Both are acceptable translations in terms of just accuracy. But I like the new NIV's translation of this better. I think garbage, actually, in, our, in the modern way we speak, gets Paul's point across a lot better. Paul is using very strong language in this chapter. Again, just a few verses before, he's calling people evildoers and dogs. He's using very strong language here. And the word rubbish nowadays, you know, it just doesn't carry that strong, uh, uh, you know, um, that strong intensity that Paul is really looking for here. He's saying, guys, anything you think you could have done to earn your salvation, it's trash. You can literally just throw it in the trash, <laughs> is what Paul is saying. So I really like this idea, this word, garbage. He says, when it comes to your salvation, at the end of the day, at the end of the day, when, when judgment day comes, all of your earthly uh, achievements, all of your merits, religious merits, they will literally be like garbage. They are worthless. They mean nothing. God will toss them to the side because they're not even a part of the conversation. Why? Why is this? Well, it's because as the Bible states in many places, at the end of the day, we're all sinners, right? Right? We're all sinners. And so if I'm relying on the things that I do, I'm in trouble because I do a lot of really bad things. I can never do enough good things to make up for all the bad things that I've done in God's sight. Romans, Paul famously says in the book of Romans, all have sinned and all fall short of the glory of God. No matter how glorious your earthly achievements might be, no matter how you might compare to other people, you might have gone to church every Sunday of your life, never missed a week. You're at Sunday school every week, you're at service every week, you're at home group every week, you help out with VBS, you go to church camp, you do all these things. Maybe you say your prayers every night of your whole life, every morning when you wake up, every night before you go to bed. You tithe every week, you give your money to the church. Maybe you've read your Bible from cover to cover a hundred times. 
Maybe you've never been drunk in your life. Maybe you've never, uh, you've been faithful in your marriage. You, you, you control your tongue well. You don't, you don't gossip and, and, and talk behind people's backs. Maybe you serve faithfully in your church. You help out with the children's ministry or the youth ministry. And you look around the church and you're able to look at all these things that other people are doing and you think to yourself, whew, man, good thing I haven't done anything as bad as they've done, Right? But at the end of the day, even if you've done all these things, guess what? You're still a sinner who falls short of God's glory. And the Bible says you've dug yourself a hole so big with your sin. You've disobeyed the Lord and, and rebelled against him so many times. You've dug a hole so big you can never get yourself out of it on your own. There, are, there is no amount of good deeds you can do to earn your salvation. Because you're a sinner. And once you're a sinner, you're a sinner. <laughs> you're not holy. God is holy. You're not righteous. God is righteous. You can't, you can't bind that back together by yourself. So Paul says, all confidence in the flesh is a false confidence. Any confidence you might have in yourself is a false confidence. All earthly gains are ultimately garbage. <laughs> They all get thrown away at the end. And this is why Paul says, yes, to put confidence in yourself is, is foolish. It's a loss. But then he says, but to put faith in Christ, that is gain. Let's read verses 8 through 9 one more time. He says, uh, earthly gains, he says, I consider them garbage that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, that comes from observing the law and doing good things. That's not how I earn righteousness, but a righteousness which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness that comes from God on the basis of faith. So Paul makes it very clear. The only way that we gain righteousness, the only way we gain that, the only way we get out of that hole We've dug for ourselves. The only way we get into good standing with the Lord again. The only way that on judgment day, the Lord doesn't look on us and see a sinner, but instead sees a righteous person, a holy person. The only way that that happens is to put your faith in Christ Jesus and the work that he did for you on the cross. Paul makes it very clear here. It's very simple. The way we are saved is by our faith in Christ. And when we stand before the throne, when we pass on, the Lord is not going to ask, well, how much did you achieve? He's not going to ask, how much ministry did you do? He's not going to ask, what was your attendance like at church? <laughs> He's not going to ask those things. He's going to say, Did you know my son? Did you love my son? Did you put your faith and your confidence in my son? That's what he's going to be concerned about. So, folks, this is very good news for us. This is very good news for us. Because if he did ask about the things I achieved and the things I did, I, just like you, would be in a whole lot of trouble. <laughs> I don't live up to the standard, do I? I, I make mistakes every day. The things I know I should be doing, I don't do. Paul says that. The things I know I, I want to do and I should do, I don't do. The things I don't want to do, sometimes I do those things. We all fail. So it's a good thing we don't have to put confidence in ourselves, isn't it? We are sinners. We are dirty, filthy, rebellious sinners. We've all done evil and wicked things, things that... We don't want anyone to know about. We've all done those things. And we all deserve the due penalty for those things, for our sins. But Jesus says, well, hang on a sec. Hang on. <laughs> How about instead of you paying the penalty, I'll just go ahead and pay it for you. All of the, all of the uh, punishment that, that you deserve, I'll just take it upon myself so that you don't have to worry about it. How's that sound? So he gives up his life. God himself handed over his life to punishment 
and suffering and even death on a cross so that we can be saved from our own sins. Is that not good news? What an act of love. What an act of grace and mercy from our God. And this is why Paul says in Ephesians chapter 2, he says, For it is by grace you have been saved. You're not saved by the things that you do. You are saved by one thing alone. That is the grace that God gives you. He says, I'm going to give you this free gift. You can take it or leave it. (laughs) So, folks, we must resist the temptation to put any confidence in ourselves. We have to resist the temptation to play this game that a lot of us play, this sort of religious game where we try to stack up as many good things as we can and check all these things off our list and make sure that, that we're doing all these things so that other people don't think we're bad Christians. And, and we have we just got to stop. Just stop. And remember, there's nothing you can do when it all comes down to it, when it's all said and done. There's nothing you can do anyway to earn the things that you're trying to earn. And so instead of worrying about those things, instead of putting confidence in those things, we have to put confidence in one thing alone, that is Jesus Christ. Christianity is not about these these religious games and these, these checklists. Christianity is about saying, thank you, Jesus. <laughs> That's what it's about. And the thing is, here's the thing. When we really are thankful for what Jesus has done it does lead us to do a lot of good things, right? The Bible's very clear about that too. The book of James says, well, the way that you prove your faith and the way that you prove your love for Christ and that you are thankful is with the things that you do, right? And so if you really are thankful for Christ, you're going to naturally uh, do a lot of good things and and share God's love with the world. That's our job, share God's love with the world. And so good, true faith does lead to good deeds, but ultimately Christianity at its core is not about the good deeds. It's about looking to the cross, believing that Christ died for you so that you can have life and putting all your stock in that. That's what it's about. Why don't you guys stand? I'm going to pray. Father, we just come to you this morning and say thank you. We know that the only way to you is through your son and through our faith in him. And so we just thank you for extending that gift, that grace, and that mercy to us. We ask that you will help us to stop uh, giving in to that idea and that temptation that somehow we we can achieve and we can earn our way back to you or that that we can, we can stand above the crowd and, and earn our way to heaven. We ask that you help us to stop giving in to those temptations in our lives. Just help us to have the freedom to remember that you've already done all the work for us. And all we have to do is trust that and believe in it. We thank you so much for your love and for all the things you do for us every day. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So maybe you're here today and, and you've never done that. You've never come to the Lord and said, wow, thank you for offering me this gift. You've never accepted the gift. You've never put your confidence in Jesus Christ. I'm going to be in the back by those chairs during this next song. I would love to talk to you about that. Maybe you have given your life to Christ, but you've kind of fallen into these bad habits where you're kind of playing the religious game uh, and, and you're comparing yourself to others and you're worrying about whether you're doing all the things you need to do and checking all the things off the list. And, and maybe you just need to come back and just maybe repent about that and just ask that the Lord would help you with that. I'd love to chat and pray with you about that as well. Whatever it is, guys, uh, I'll be in the back uh, by those chairs. I'd love to talk with you during this next song.